Pastor Weaver is a little hard of hearing. <laughs> the closest person to me in the building, and he couldn't. How many heard what I was saying? I was just going to use one of those stands, but he, it's okay. It's good to watch Pastor Weaver move the pulpit. <laughs> What'd you say, Pastor? <laughs> I don't need a pulpit. <laughs> How many of you doing good tonight? Good. Well, this is an exciting service uh, as we baptize. Uh, always a great service to experience people following Jesus in water baptism, and uh, tonight is a, a special night for that. So I'm going to preach a message for you, just, just short, short as relative, you know, uh, but we want to give plenty of time for baptism at the end. But if you have a Bible and you want to turn to 1 Samuel chapter 14, I'm going to start with a a few verses of a passage of scripture that is one of my favorite stories in the Bible, and you'll have to go back and read what happens because we're just going to kind of get the setup to the story. Uh, but tonight I want to share with you just a few thoughts with, on this title, Influence. And I think it ties in really well with uh, this whole uh, water baptism tonight. Uh, we are called to, to go. And we're called to make a difference in the world. We're called to be witnesses. Jesus said, we're, we're salt and we are light. And those two things make an impact on the, uh, on the vicinity around us. And so we'll get to that scripture in just a moment, Matthew chapter 5. You can turn there if you want to and hold your finger there. But let's start with 1 Samuel chapter 14. And this is uh, uh, Jonathan, King Saul's son, and his armor bearer, and it says this, one day Jonathan said to his armor bearer, come on, let's go over to where the Philistines have their outpost. But Jonathan did not tell his father what he was doing. So his father is Saul, who is the king, and uh, they, the Philistine army has come against them. And uh, Jonathan gets up and, and basically just says, you and me, to his armor bearer, let's, let's go on over and see what might happen with the Philistines. Meanwhile, verse 2, Saul and his 600 men were camped out on the outskirts of Gibeah around the pomegranate tree in Migran. Among Saul's men were Ahijah the priest who was wearing the ephod, the priestly vest. Ahijah was the son of Ichabod's brother Ahitub, son of Phinehas, son of Eli, the priest of the Lord who had served at Shiloh. No one realized that Jonathan had left the Israelite camp. To reach the Philistine outpost, Jonathan had to go down between two rocky cliffs that were called Bozes and Sina. The cliff on the north was in the front of Michmash, and the one on the south was in front of Geba. Let's go across to the outpost of those pagans, Jonathan said to his armor bearer. Perhaps the Lord will help us, for nothing can hinder the Lord. He can win a battle whether he has many warriors or only a few. And the armor bearer replied to him, do what you think is best. I am with you completely whatever you decide. And the NIV says the armor bearer's response is this, do all that you have in mind, go ahead. I am with you, heart and soul. Talk about influence tonight. And that, that story is an incredible story. These two guys, Jonathan gets this idea that me and my armor bearer, while my dad, the king, uh, the ruler of the armies of Israel, sits under the pomegranate tree and they won't go fight those Philistines. He gets his armor bearer and says, how about you and me just go on over to their outpost and see what happens? Perhaps the Lord will bring us victory. How many of you all in on something like that? You and your guy carrying your armor and uh, the Philistine army. Those guys are giants. As we talk about influence tonight, um, Jonathan understood his sphere of influence. And we notice what Jonathan didn't do. He didn't go wake up his father, Saul. His father had already made up his mind he wasn't going to go attack the Philistines. He was going to stay under the pomegranate tree. Jonathan didn't have influence with his father, and he didn't have authority over the army. He didn't even have command over his armor bearer to follow him, but the armor bearer's response says everything here. It was an expression of obedience, and even beyond that, it was his allegiance. He said to Jonathan, even though this might have been the craziest idea, the most stupidest plan he'd ever heard of, I'm with you, whatever you decide, I'm with you heart and soul. 
There's a guy who he's had some influence with. Let's see, a person's title, their position, their authority may hold some power, but influence is what has a greater effect. And that influence happens through relationship. Influence is always more powerful than authority. You see, authority, uh, it's positional power. It can control the actions of another person, but it doesn't capture the person's heart. There's manipulation, which is the use of influence to benefit uh, my gain by having control over someone else. Uh, it can shape what, it, what, what a person does, but influence shapes what a person becomes. The reality is you can use influence for, for good and for bad. How many of you know that to be true? Influence is something that's contagious. And as Christians, we should be contagious. I want to be a contagious person. If you look at the word influence here on the screen, what's in the middle of that? What word do you see in the middle of influence? Flu. The word influenza. How many of you have maybe had a touch of that over this past year? It was pretty much an epidemic. There was a lot of people that experienced flu. Um, and that's just one of those things that, man, you do not want to come in contact with someone who has the flu because it's highly contagious. Through uh, personal contact, the flu is contagious. You know what? Influence and influenza, basically the same word. Influenza, I believe, has Italian origin, but it basically means influence. And why? Because of what happens when we come in contact with someone who has influenza, we're sure to get it. And not only just coming into personal contact, it's pretty much an airborne disease. So if you come anywhere near somebody, uh, it, it can be contagious. That's what we want. We want to have that kind, of, that kind of influence on the world around us. John Maxwell, some of you have heard of him, uh, has a book on becoming a person of influence. And this is what he says. Everyone is an influencer of other people. Every one of us in this room from the youngest to the oldest, is an influencer of other people. It doesn't matter who you are or what you do. You don't have to be in a high-profile prof occupation to be a person of influence. If your life in any way connects with, connects with other people, then you're an influencer. We're all being influenced by someone or something, and we are all influencers. We all pass a bit of ourselves on to other people. So we need to make sure that what we are giving to others is a blessing and not a curse. Character is the, is the resource from which influence draws. And relationships are the avenue through which influence travels. It comes, happens out of relationship. There's no way Jonathan was going to get anyone to go with him that didn't have relationship with him. But it was that connection, that relationship, the influence that he had with his armor bearer, his armor bearer, uh, not, he, he didn't see him say, eh, let me think about it overnight just a little bit. No, he said, whatever you decide, I'm with you, heart and soul. Jesus said it this way, you are the salt of the earth, Matthew 5, verse 13. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled by men. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. He said we are to be salt and we are to be light. Salt and light. What does salt do? In Jesus' day, salt was a preservative. Uh, they didn't have the uh, trusty refrigerator in the, in the kitchen that they could go put their, their fresh goods in, their meat or whatever. No, they rubbed salt into the meat to cure it so that it would last for a, for a while. It was a preservative. We know that salt is something that adds, adds flavor. 
It adds to the taste of what we eat. Light is something that we use to see things around us. Light is something that is used to be able to see what is going on around us. It's an influence that improves our visibility. I want you to think about the crowd that Jesus was speaking to on this day, Matthew chapter five. It wasn't a conference of superpowers. He wasn't speaking to Congress. He wasn't speaking to Parliament or City Hall. It was a crowd on a hillside, a group of common people, people with no high ambitions or or positions. The Israelites were under occupation by the Romans, and so they couldn't even make their own laws. They couldn't uh, plan their own futures. They couldn't even determine their own destinies. They were a people who were being occupied and controlled by the Romans, and yet Jesus stood in front of them and said, you're the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. You make a difference in the world around you. Tony Campolo told a story about a a friend who was walking through the midway at a county fair when he met a tiny girl and she was carrying a a big fluff of cotton candy. How many of you love cotton candy? Anybody? Nobody? Couple, Couple takers over there. Well, this little girl was carrying this huge fluff of cotton candy on a stick uh, almost as big as she was, and, he's, and this man said to her, how can a little girl like you eat all that cotton candy? Well, she said to him, I'm much bigger on the inside <laughs> than I am on the outside. Pastor Weaver talked about the influence of the Holy Spirit on our, on our lives, and the truth is, is we as Christians with the Holy Spirit in us are much bigger on the inside than what we look like on the outside. It's what's inside of us that is that influence. We're the salt of the earth. We're the light of the world. Why? Because we have, because we have some great power or position in government, because we're smart or we're strong or we're gifted. No, Jesus would say, you're the light of the world, you're the salt of the earth, because you belong to me. On the outside, you might seem to be nothing, but on the inside, he says, you have my power and my strength, and with that, you make a difference. Acts 1.8, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. We're called to be influencers. And it's the power of Jesus, the power of the Holy Spirit inside of us that makes the difference. There's a story of a pastor in Texas who was in a hurry after work and he had to get to the mall for some items and uh, then go to his daughter's school to pick her up, take her home, get to a deacon's meeting and then spend a couple uh, hours in the evening uh, doing some counseling. How many of you have evenings sometimes that look like that? From one thing to the next to the next. Once he got on the mall, he saw an advertisement on a music store window that said two CDs for $9.99. He loved music so much that he decided he just had to go in and take advantage of that, so he went in, picked up two CDs uh, that he had really been wanting, uh, and he went to the register to pay for them. He threw down with his money while talking uh, to everyone around him, as pastors often can do, Pastor Weaver, for sure. Maybe a little distracted. Okay. And then he picked up his bag and his change and he walked out of the mall. When he threw the bag in the front seat of his car, he noticed for the first time that the clerk had charged him $1.99 instead of $9.99 for those two CDs. His first thought was that he didn't have time to go back in and get it fixed, but a small voice kept saying inside of him, you don't have time not to. And so he went back in, he stood in that same line until he came, uh, his time came to talk to this clerk once again, and he said, look, I'm I'm, I'm in a hurry, you made a mistake. The sign says $9.99 for these two CDs, and you only charged me $1.99, I need you to make this uh, correct for me so I can get on with what I gotta do. And she said, sir, I didn't make a mistake. He said, you sure did. The sign here says, 999, here's the receipt. Please make the correction. She said, no, sir, I didn't make a mistake. What do you mean, she said. She said, can I tell you the rest of the story? Would you let me finish my story? And he said, sure. And she said, for 17 years, I've been out of church. 
Recently, my life has been falling apart, and I needed to get back into church. And I looked around for a church that was closest to me, and I found the name of a church, and I went there Sunday, and I slipped in and sat on the back row. The pastor that day was speaking on integrity. Sir, it happened to be your church, and you were the one that was speaking. And when I saw you in my line, I wondered if this was just something that you preached on Sunday or that you lived on Monday. And I determined to find out. And then she said, sir, I don't even know the right questions to ask. But I know that whatever you've got, I want and I need. And then she began to cry. The manager, who was a born-again Christian, uh, dismissed the clerk and took over her spot. And the pastor went over and led this young lady uh, to a relationship with Jesus. Would that have happened had it not been that voice inside of him, that, that integrity and that character, that uh, salt of the earth, that light of the world that he was supposed to be to really make a difference. It's beyond us. There's a story of uh, a missionary in Africa who gave a Bible to one of the African men and when it was given to him, the man hugged it so close and expressed great appreciation for this most precious gift of God's word that, that the missionary had given to him. But when the missionary saw him a, a few days later, he noticed much to his dismay that the Bible looked like it was already falling apart and that many of its pages were missing. The missionary asked him, what happened? What did you do to your Bible? When I gave it to you, you considered this Bible to be your most treasured possession. The man replied, indeed, it is my very most precious possession. It's the finest gift that I've ever received. It's so precious that when I returned to my village, I very carefully chose a page and tore it out and I gave it to my mother. And then I tore out another page and gave it to my father. And I tore out another page and I gave it to my wife. Finally, I gave a page of the word of God to everyone who lives in my village. What does that story have to do with anything? It was a precious, prized possession, the word of God. And he so treasured this gift that it wasn't something that he was going to hold on to. Nobody else had a Bible, and he decided one page at a time, I'm going to give this gift to this person. I'm going to give this gift to this person. The reality is, is we're all walking, talking, breathing. As Christians, we're Jesus people. We're lights. And we not, may not be tearing pages of the Bible out, but hopefully our life is a living witness, a living testimony, and we're giving people around us, we're influencing them with what Jesus has done in us, and we're giving them his word. We need Jesus. We need his Holy Spirit, and there's a world around us that needs that too. Not only are we influencers, we need to be influencers of the right thing. I want to read this passage of scripture in Matthew chapter 5 one more time for you in uh, the message version of the Bible, and I'm going to invite the musicians to come back. This is what the message version says of Matthew chapter 5 verse 13. Let me tell you why you're here. You're here to be salt seasoning that brings out the God flavors of this earth. If you lose your saltiness, how will people taste godliness? You've lost your usefulness and will end up in the garbage. Here's another way to put it. You're here to be light, bringing out the God colors in the world. God is not a secret to be kept. We're going public with this, as public as a city on a hill. If I make you light bearers, you don't think I'm going to hide you under a bucket, do you? I'm putting you on a light stand. Now, now that I've put you there on a hilltop on a light stand, shine. Keep open house. Be generous with your lives by opening up to others you'll prompt people to open up with God, this generous Father in heaven. What a privilege we have to be salt and to be light, to make a difference, to have an influence on the world around us. We have a, a, a number of people this evening who are being water baptized. God has done something special in their lives. He saved them, changed them, turned their lives around, 
the old person that used to be is, is, is dead and gone, and there's a new, a new life that happens. Jesus said, the old is gone, and the new has come. There's a difference that, that, that takes place when Jesus comes into a life. And we're to be different. Tonight, I want each of you to look into your own life and your own heart and ask this question. Have I lost my saltiness? How bright is my light burning? Am I the 100 watt light bulb that I started out to be or has it dimmed down to a mere 15 watts? Are we, are we really passionate about Jesus? Is it something that's contagious in us? And if not, I think it's time to reignite, to re-engage. And I want to invite you just to bow your heads with me and close your eyes. And there may be some people in the room tonight that, that don't have a relationship with Jesus. There's, there's, you've not experienced Jesus, the light of the world, that can change your life. It's an exciting time tonight as we share in this experience of water baptism. And that's a, another step in that process. But there's an initial step that comes to surrendering our lives to Jesus and say, there is a plan for my life. I was designed and created with a plan and for a purpose. And that comes from Jesus Christ. We came from him. The Bible says we're his workmanship. We're his, his masterpiece created in Christ Jesus for him to accomplish his plan, to accomplish his work in us. And so with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, is there anyone here that tonight you'd say, I, I don't have a relationship with Jesus and I want to experience what that really, really means and I, want, I need a change in my life. Not just I want to try it out, but you realize that you've been going in a direction with your life and it's led to disappointment and frustration and there's not a lot of hope. Jesus is the hope. He's the light. He's the difference. He's the answer. If that's you tonight and you just want to want to give your life to Jesus tonight, would you just raise your hand and maybe uh, look at me and I want to pray with you and pray for you tonight. Is there anyone here? I want to ask a second question and, and that is this to those who I'm assuming you are our believers, you've given your life to Jesus. But really just examining your own life and you realize, you know what, I'm not really that salty. I've not been the salt that I have been called to be. My light is not burning that bright. It's beginning to wane. Or my light's been hidden under a bucket and it's time to shine again. How many of you would say, pray for me? That's, I, need, I need more saltiness in my life. I need my light to shine. Father, I pray tonight that our hearts would respond in, in such a way to say, Jesus, you've called us to be salt and light. You've called us to be influencers, to make a difference in this world for your kingdom. That's what you've placed us here for. You've, call, you've saved us and you've called us to go and to take that message wherever we go. Lord, work in my heart and my life and my light and my saltiness, God. Restore me, make me who you want me to be. Let my life be like I'm leaving a page here and I'm leaving a page there and I'm taking that message to everyone that I come in contact with. It may be a simple conversation where we didn't even really expect anything to happen but we're being obedient and following you and following your purpose and your plan. God, may our hearts desire tonight to say yes to you, Lord, that we really, truly want more.